Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> Tonight we're going to be learning about the three weeks and the nine days that are coming up. We just mentioned the Arizal's yurt site is coming up soon. We'll mention him as well. So let's start with the, the idea of the three weeks and the theme that we're going to uh, explore tonight is the Mishnah says that five things happened on Yud Zayin B'Tamuz, the fast day of Yud Zayin B'Tamuz, and five things happened on Tisha B'Av. And the first thing, is we have actually very limited time, but the first thing of Yud Zayin B'Tamuz is the breaking of the Luchot. Moshe Rabbeinu came down from Har Sinai. He sees them dancing around a golden calf, and he breaks the Luchot. What's the first thing the Mishnah says happened on Tisha B'Av? Is the, the day that the spies came back from 40 days in Eretz Yisrael. And <clears throat> 10 of the spies said, we can't make it. People are too strong, cities are fortified, we won't be able to make it. And the people cried and said, let's go back to Mitzrayim. But then after that, it says, the next two things is that both temples were destroyed on Tisha B'Av. So the three weeks are bookcased by two types of breaking. The first is the breaking of the Luchot, and the second is the breaking of the Temple, the destruction of the Temple. So two ideas of breaking. So what I wanted to do tonight is I wanted to take <clears throat> this concept of breaking and trying to understand its source and also to try to understand the, the tikkun that could come out of it. I just, I just want to say that instead of many things that I'm going to say tonight, in fact, most of the things I'm going to say tonight are teachings from Rob Ginsburg. So I'm just announcing that beforehand, so I don't have to each time say, this is from Rob Ginsburg and this is from Rob Ginsburg, but most of what I'm teaching is either in Rob Ginsburg's books or over the 43 years that I've been a student of the Rav, I've heard in, in person. So the first thing is we have to go back and understand what the source of the breaking is. And I'm sure it will sound very familiar to you. This is what's called Shvira Tekeling. This is the primordial breaking of the vessels in the beginning of creation. As most of you know, that when the original initial lights of creation came into being, the initial vessels were too immature to be able to hold this awesome light and they broke. Now, what were these vessels? According to Kabbalah, these were the spherot. The light coming into the spherot in the previous world called Olamatohu broke. And this, for many people, this is a very, very abstract, cosmological, Kabbalistic concept called Shvira Tekelim in this almost mythical world called Olamatohu. But uh, I want to give you some examples of how real Shvira Tekelim is in all of our lives on, on almost a daily level. So I'm going to throw out a couple of <clears throat> common expressions that we all use or we hear or we think or we relate to. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the first one is, 
I can't handle this. I'm freaking out. This is too much for me. I need some space. I can't, I can't handle this. What's going on here? Do these sound familiar to everyone? These are expressions that we use all the time, but what do they, what do they symbolize? That there's too much light, there's too much energy happening and we can't handle it emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, sometimes even physically. The energy is too much. This is Shvirata Kalim in our own lives. So the Torah it also, when we talk about Moshe breaking the Luchot, this is a mirror image of the primordial breaking of the vessels. Here, Moshe is coming down after 40 days on Har Sinai with the Luchot that were written with the, however we understand this, with the finger of God. So you can imagine the, the light, the light of receiving the Torah and Shavuos of Mount Sinai. It was an incredible, awesome light. The seven heavens opened. People could hear what you could ordinarily only see, could see what you could only ordinarily hear. Space, time, and consciousness all merged together. That's a lot of energy. That's a lot of light. So Moshe Rabbeinu comes down with the Luchot. But 40 days later, the, the, the people were, were just coming out of Egypt. They did not have the proper vessels to receive the first Luchot. So this is the symbol of Shvira Tekelim in the Torah itself. And of course, the breaking of the temples, the destruction of the temples is the same. The first temple, the Shekhinah, was in the temple. The divine presence was palpably felt, tangibly felt. So you can imagine, if anyone has been at the Kotel, you have to remember the Kotel is a retaining wall for the Temple of Mount. It actually is not part of the temple. It's, a, it's the lower retaining wall at which the Temple Mount was situated. On top of the Temple Mount sat the temple. And I'm sure most of us at one time or another have had an awesome experience at the Dakota. But if you can multiply that a thousand fold, that was the energy that was in the temple. So where, where is the source even earlier in the, in the Torah for this concept of Shvira Tekelim? And Rav Ginsburg says that what I'm about to give over, the, the Arizal invested more time and effort in, these, in this passage than in any other part of the Torah. So what are we referring to? In the book of Bereshit, it's, it gives over the lineage of Asaph. And it says, these are the kings that ruled in Edom before there was a king in Israel. And the Torah continues by naming eight different kings. And each one, it says, they, he ruled and he died. He ruled and he died. He ruled and he died. Until the eighth king, which we'll discuss more. It says, it doesn't say that he died. And it names his wife and where he came from. So that we'll get to in, in a minute. But the Ari explained that what, what is this talking about? If you read it, it's like, why do I need to know this? So the Ari explained that these kings who ruled and died, these are the vessels 
that broke in Shvira Tekelim. Each of the kings is one of the Svirot, and they ruled, but because they wanted to rule by themselves, this is what the Ari gives over, that at this part of creation, each one of the Svirot said, Ani Amloch, I can handle all the energy by myself. I don't need to relate to the other Svirot. I don't need to relate to anyone else. I can rule here. But what happened? Each one of them broke. Each one of them shattered. In one of Rav Ginsburg's books, I'm not exaggerating, he spends 300 pages explaining this short passage in Bereshit about these eight kings. 300 pages. Quite amazing. So, for all of the women out there, especially the women, of course, all the men also, but Rav Ginsburg taught that there are eight kings here. But right after it mentions the eight kings, it mentions 11 princes. princes. So in other words, in, of Asaph, there were these eight kings that ruled before there was a king in Israel, and 11 princes. So if you add eight and 11, you get 19. What's the significance of 19? The name Chava, Eve. So what does this have to do with anything? So this is, we're going to start tying things together here. That it's given over in Kabbalah and Hasidut that before Mashiach comes, there will be this fixing called Tikkun Chava. The fixing of Chava. What is the fixing of Chava? It means the fixing of the status of women in the world. We know that after Chava ate from the fruit, tree of knowledge of good and evil, and then she gave to Adam to eat, there was a fall. We left Gan Eden. And historically, the status of women fell. In, in virtually every society, there's a, a manifestation of the fall of women. And this is very, very connected to the, 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 the Gomorrah that talks about how on the fourth day of creation, so first it says the two great lights, and then it says the greater light and the smaller light. So the Gomorrah explains in very allegorical, symbolic ways that the moon, which represents the feminine, came and said to God, how can two kings wear one crown? They're two great lights. Who's going to rule here? And God said, you're right. Go and make yourself small. And that's how the moon has come to be what's called the lesser light. It reflects the light of the sun. So we're told, you look at the, the words of Kiddush Levana, that when Mashiach comes, the light of the moon will shine as bright as the light of the sun. So this passage in the Torah which hints to the breaking. Remember, each king ruled and he died. He ruled and he died. So this represents the breaking of the vessels. So what's interesting here, why did I bring this whole thing of Tikkun Chava? We're told that at the, at the sin of the golden calf, the women did not participate. 
we're told that the men brought the gold and the jewelry, but the women refused to participate. And we're also told that when the spies came back and said, we can't, we can't make it to, to Israel, so the women also, they didn't, they, didn't hear, they didn't listen. That's why it says that when we wandered in the desert for 40 years, it said all of the men between ages of 20 and 60 passed away. It didn't say all of the people, because the women, they believed we could come into Eretz Israel. So part of the fixing that will occur before Mashiach comes is this idea of tikkun chava. Now this is hinted to in the eighth king. The eighth king, his name is Hadar, and he's the only one whose wife's name is mentioned, Mehetavel. And it's given over that this is very, very important because the eighth king represents the final redemption. And that redemption is dependent on the union of masculine and feminine. All the other kings, it, it, it says that it doesn't say they were unmarried, but it doesn't mention their wife. So either they were unmarried or the Torah is teaching us that by not mentioning their names, obviously their husbands didn't think they were that important. <laughs> so either way, they tried to rule by themselves. And one of the signs of the impending redemption is when the status of women will rise in the world and we see it everywhere. Over the last, I'm just guessing, last 25, 30 years, we've seen the role of women all over the world change almost completely for the good, for the good. So now, now that we've established this idea that from Yud Zion Batamuz till Tishabav is bookcased by breaking, this concept of Shvira to Kaling. But we want to look at also the positive. We want to look at the positive aspect. We have a concept that is mentioned all of the time which is called Yerida L'Tzorach Aliyah, going down for the sake of going up. Or the concept of Listor Almanat Livnot, to break down for the sake of rebuilding. And I see my good friend Shalom Schwartz there, for those, those who are connected in any way with, with the Moshav. So Dafka this week, in the middle of the three weeks, finally, after 14 months, they demolished all of the burnt out houses on the Moshav. And so the whole last week, actually today also, probably last a few more days, it's like massive destruction. And yet, there can't be a rebuilding until this occurs. And this, in our own personal lives, this is one of the greatest tests that people have sometimes, is when faced with tragedy, destruction, disappointment, frustration, to be able to see beyond that to how the rebuilding is going to happen. Because sometimes we get caught up in the shvira takeling and we can't see a greater purpose coming out of it. But that's where faith comes in. 
That's where inner strength comes from. And if we think how many how many shvirata kalims the Jewish people have gone through. I mean, if if you counted every community in every country over the last. 2,500 years from the destruction of the first temple, there's hundreds, thousands of individual spheratakalims that happened. And yet here, here we are, back in Eretz Yisrael, almost a majority of Jews in the world are now back in Eretz Yisrael. After only 70, 75 years from one of the greatest Shvira Tekelim in all of Jewish history, the, the Holocaust. And yet here we are. So all of Hasidus gives over that the three weeks, it's, it is a heavy time. And it's a serious time. And it's a time for great contemplation. But it's not a time for sadness or depression. That's not, that's not what we're supposed to be feeling. We are supposed to really meditate and contemplate Jewish history and the present, for sure, but not from a state of, of sadness or depression, rather from the desire to fix. In the Nativa Shalom, so he asked a question about why are we crying on Tisha are we crying about something that happened 2,000 years ago? Well, the answer is, in part, certainly yes. But he said, on a much deeper level, what we're really crying about is that we have not managed to rebuild the temple in the, in the present. That's what the Gemara says, that if you live in a generation where the temple has not been rebuilt, it's as if you're living through the destruction. So the Nativa Shalom said that's a much deeper level of what we should be feeling deeply is what's going on in the world today, what's going on among the Jewish people that we have not managed yet to bring Mashiach and rebuild the temple. But also, just on a personal level, on a personal level, to try to understand the purpose of the, of, of the breaking of the vessels is three, I'm going to bring three metaphors, is, and they're really all from nature. One is, if you take trees, foliage, greenery. When it comes to fall and winter, the leaves begin to fall. The, some of the fruit begins to rot on the tree. And it falls. And what happens to it? It decomposes. And it makes the minerals for further growth. So what looks like like the end, the tree is going dormant. Everything is falling apart. But that which is falling apart becomes the food, becomes the nourishment for further growth. The same thing is when you, when you look into cosmology, physics, when stars explode, they literally seed the universe with the elements for new planets, new galaxies. And the last one is from Bereshit, from the first day of creation, where it says, Vayi era, Vayi boker, Yom Echad. First it was evening, and then it was day. And in fact, in the third verse of the, of the Torah, it mentions the creation of light. But already in the second verse, it mentioned darkness. Darkness comes before light. So everyone knows this metaphor that the greatest light, excuse me, the greatest darkness comes right before the dawn. 
So we see three different examples from nature, how what could appear to be darkness, decom things decomposing, stars exploding, but each one of them is, is needed. The Gemara says that Hashem created 974 worlds and each one was destroyed. But how do we understand that? Each world that was destroyed became the foundation of the next world. And that's why, according to the Arizal, the previous world is called Olamatohu, the world of, we'll call it chaos. And this world is called Olamatikun. And that this world is made up of the broken pieces of the previous world. That's why in the Eleno, every single day, we, we pray, L'takein olam b'malchut shakai, to rectify the world in, in the kingdom of God. So this idea of tikkun olam is, we end every prayer, shachri mincha mayrav, with, with, with a prayer to rectify the world. And we're told that God made us partners in the rectification of the world. That's why the last words of, of Shabbat in, in, in the story of creation is Asher, Asher bara Elohim la'asot, that God made to do. And everyone asks, what's that word to do doing there? It's very redundant. Grammatically, it doesn't really fit that God made, period. But it says God made to do. So it's brought down that to do means to fix. And who's supposed to do the fixing? Mankind. But that is the purpose of mankind, is to fix the world. So the Arizal in a sense, reframed all of Jewish history with the following Torah. In Musaf of Shabbos and on holidays, we mentioned that we can't bring the proper sacrifices to the temple due to our sins. Meaning that the temple was destroyed because of our misdoings. All of the prophets came and warned the people that if you change your ways and create a righteous society and you do good and you take care of the poor and the widow and the orphan, the, tar the, the, the temple will not be destroyed. But if you don't do these things, God has revealed to the prophets that the temple will be destroyed. We know that the people did not listen, and the temples were destroyed, and we went into exile. So that's the simple understanding, the simple understanding. The Arizal took that same scenario and he reinterpreted it in the following way, that since this world is made up of the broken shards of a previous world, and what are in these shards? Light, sparks of light. And these sparks of light need to be redeemed. They need to be uplifted. They need to be made holy. And so the Arizal said, on a deep level, why did we have to go into exile? Is because there were shattered vessels with holy light scattered all over the world. 
And we had to go into exile in order to find those sparks of light and to redeem them and to bring them back to Eretz Yisrael. And maybe the person who picked up on this the most was Rav Cook. Rav Cook's teachings are full of this concept that the Jewish people are coming back to Eretz Yisrael and they're bringing with them all these sparks of light that needed to be redeemed from around the world and that when enough of the sparks make it back to Eretz Yisrael, then or chadash but Sion Tayir, a new light will shine in Sion. And this is not just like a nice teaching, it is, it is actually happening. Approximately 125 years ago, there were no more than 10, 20,000 Jews in Eretz Yisrael. Go back to the, let's say, 1870s. 150 years ago, let's say. There are, uh, I don't know the exact number, but there were not more than 20, 30,000 Jews in all of Eretz Yisrael. In just 150 years, and most people have read Mark Twain's um, explanation of his visit to Eretz Yisrael, where he was astounded, astounded by the emptiness of the land. This was the holy land. And he got here and was like, it's like empty. It's like, what's going on here? <laughs> 150 years later, look at us. This is exactly what the Aris said. This is exactly what Rav Cook said would happen. This is what all the prophets of old said would happen. And these are the same prophets who prophesied about the destruction of the temple. But every single one of them gave over, over a complementary teaching of redemption. For every prophecy warning the people of an impending destruction, if they didn't change their ways, is a prophecy of hope and redemption. So in a sense, that is our job during the three weeks. But truthfully, to get to that place, we do have to delve into the into the, we'll call it the pain of Jewish history. But not so much that we become depressed by it. We should become inspired, especially in our time, when we, are, we have one foot in redemption already. The other foot, unfortunately, is still very much in exile. But we do have a foot very strongly planted in the redemptive process which is taking place before us. So now I only have a few more minutes. I want to give over just a few, we'll call them gems here. When the Arizal explained about the breaking of the vessels, so Seemingly strangely, he put a number on how many broken vessels there were. Because if we think about it, if, if, if you look at, let's say, a star exploding, so there's like, let's say, trillions of, of particles that are going to be scattered across the universe. But the Ari put a number on it, 288. He said there are 288 broken vessels. So where did he get this from? If you look in the second verse of the Torah. So it says, The, the earth was chaos and void. 
and there was darkness on the face of the abbess, and the Spirit of God moved or hovered over the waters. So the Midrash from 2,000 years ago, Midrash Rabbah, says, what was this Spirit of God that moved on the waters? They said the Spirit of Mashiach. The Spirit of Mashiach. So what we learn from this is an amazing thing. Whereas evolution will tell us that there is no intrinsic purpose or direction to the world. It's happening the way it's happening, the way nature has put it together. There's no overriding purpose or someone or something directing it other than maybe survival of the fittest. But here we see from this Midrash, already the spirit of Mashiach was hovering over the waters. So this word for hovering is mirachefet. If you look at the first letter and the last letter of this word, the first letter is a mem, mirachefet, and the last letter is a tav. Spells Mem Tov spells met, died. What are the middle letters? Resh, Chet, Pe. They equal 288. So remember, the verse begins, and, and the earth was Tohu Vivohu. So this is hinting to the previous world of Tohu, where the lights were so great. It could not be contained by the vessels. And these vessels died, like the kings. They died. They ruled and they died. And the middle letters are 288. Now, what's the significance of this? Is on Tuesday night is Rosh Chodesh Av. But in most synagogues, this past Shabbos, when we did Mivarchi Machodesh, and we named the month, in most synagogues it's called Menachem Av, which means the, depending how you want to translate it, but Av means father. Menachem is one who consoles. So it can be read, this is the month where God is consoling us. What is this connected to? The Haftorah right after Tisha B'Av is Nachamu, Nachamu Ami. Nachamu comes from the same word as Mirachem. Menachem and Mirachem are very close to each other. So, merachem, which means to have compassion, equals 288. And so, Rav Ginsburg teaches over, we began by saying that one of the great tikkunim that has to happen before Mashiach comes is tikkun chava, is the fixing of the female stature in the world. But Rav Ginsburg also taught that one of the keys to redemption is compassion. And he taught like this, a very simple but beautiful teaching. He said there are three levels of compassion. He said one level is we should have compassion on every human being who is born into this world. Why? is because a soul coming down into a physical body is a, it's a very traumatic experience, especially into a, a, a flawed, somewhat broken, material, physical world. For, for a lofty soul 
to come down. We're all created in the image of God. To come down into a body, we should have compassion on every human being. The second level of compassion is we should have compassion on every Jew. Because we just look at our history, especially during the three weeks, and no matter what a person, a Jew, looks like, kippah, not kippah, mitzvot, not mitzvot, every Jew deserves compassion. And the last one is that we should all have compassion on God. Because when we read Menachem Av, we could read it, the Father has compassion on us, or you can read it that we have compassion on our Father in heaven. So we'll end with one more image that is related to women. Remember, we started with a very, very important thing is that women did not take part with, of the golden calf, for which we have a fast day of Yud Zayim Batamus, and did not take part in the, the whole saga of the spies, which happened on Tisha B'av. And the Midrash says that God said, you're crying for no reason. In the future, it will be established a day of crying for all generations. We all know the, the famous teaching that Mashiach is born on Tisha B'av. And the ninth day of Av is very connected to the nine months of pregnancy. Tesha Yerche Leda, like we say in Echad Mi Yodea, the nine months of pregnancy. So right now in the three weeks, the whole world, and I'm mentioning this especially because of the matzav that we live in right now, the entire world right now is in a state of, of birth pangs. And during the nine days, they increase. And then we have another archetypal breaking that happens on Tisha B'Av. Symbolically, for Mashiach to be born, there has to be the breaking of the waters. A woman that can't give birth, does not give birth until her waters break. Once her waters break, then that's a sign it's imminent. It's going to be soon. So I'm going to end with, with, with a bracha that these last approximately four months, the world has gone through an unprecedented time. Not, not that this is the first pandemic that there's ever been in the world. There have been actually much worse than, than, than what's happening now. But because of the media and because of our the information highway, like 500 years ago, there could have been a pandemic in, doesn't matter where, somewhere in Asia. We might never have heard about it. Or maybe we'd hear about it 10 years later when a traveler would come and say, do you know what just happened six years ago? But now, we get news instantaneously. We're all aware. Just the fact that I'm like looking out at all of you <laughs> and everyone is in their own house on different continents, different time zones, and we can all connect. That's what's unprecedented. And so We truly are waiting for something new to be born here. We are going through Yarche Leda. We're going through the birth pangs of Mashiach. That is exactly what we're going through. 
So I can only only pray, and I'm sure you're you're praying also, that when we come out the other side here, that it really is or chadash of Sion Ta'ir, a new light should be shining on Sion. And we should all share in that light. And we should all plug into that light right now. And I'll end with something from the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who in his very, very famous, uh, close to last will and testament on the 28th of Nisan, when he publicly told everyone, I've done everything I can do to bring Mashiach, the rest is in your hands. And he ended by saying, one thing I can tell you is, the way to do it is to take Orot de Tohu, the Kelim de Tikkun, to take the lights of Tohu, these awesome, holy, exalted lights that initially we did not have vessels for, and to put them into vessels that can now hold the light. The problem with the Olam Tohu is there was too much light and not enough vessels. And what's the problem with the world today? We have so many vessels it's such a material, physical world, we don't have enough light. So the Rebbe was saying the way to bring Mashiach is we have to connect to this awesomely high light. And each one of us has to become a vessel and then share that light. So I bless everyone with the light of redemption. I just want to end for many of you uh, tune in to these classes on Sunday night from the students of Rob Ginsburg. Those who don't, I just want to remind everyone that every Sunday night at 8.15 uh, Israel time, uh, excuse me, 8.30 Israel time, and then at 9.15 there are two classes. Uh, I was pinch hitting tonight, but maybe I will be back <laughs> and I will see you again. I, I would like that very much. And uh, thank you all for coming. And Lahitra Ot. Lahitra Ot. <laughs>